Um, we're at the Kunsthaus in Zurich. This is one of the hot spots of Zurich culture. Uh, the uh, Kunsthaus, that is the art museum behind us, across the street over there, is the Stadttheater, the uh, Schauspielhaus. Schauspielhaus, the main theater of Zurich. <clears throat> and we're surrounded by art. And uh, what brings you to your special interest in art? I know you like to work with pictures in your practice. You've developed special uh, lectures and uh, teaching on art. What first stimulated that for you? Yes, I uh, had uh, since uh, early uh, time in my life uh, very much uh, a great interest in art. I even thought to, to study art. Oh, is that right? I, yes, yeah, before yeah. I decided to, to uh, star, uh, study theology. Uh, so uh, it's a very old interest since yeah. old time. Um, I had also always uh, done my own pictures without any pre idea. Ambition. You're an artist, actually. <laughs> no, not at all, but what, uh, an interest. Do you in show it. your art to anybody? I haven't seen any of your work. No, so, but you will perhaps one day. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I um, studied in uh, with the uh, Jesuits, uh, philosophy and the uh, theology, I plan also to uh, to do uh, a school in uh, a cinema in Munich. Oh, really? Yes, yes. But finally, um, my plan changed. So um, I can say that uh, it's something which is accompanying uh, uh -huh. accompanying me since a long time. Well, did you study art as a as a boy, as a lad? Did you go to museum? You grew up in Basel, yes. right? There's a, a great museum, several, I guess, in Basel. Yeah, I was uh, really very interested in, in art. I went very often, even as a young boy, to the art museum. Mm -hmm. I uh, We had the fantastic, uh, wonderful exhibitions there in the Kunstmuseum in, in Basel and um, uh, I remember even that uh, one day, uh, one year, um, I spent the, the whole vacation going every day into the art museum <laughs> to write all the descriptions on the, the, the paintings. Uh, to well, the a kind of scholarship. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it is. And, uh, that's the, the reason why, very naturally, I got interested too later when I started uh, psychology in this aspect, uh, visual expression. Uh -huh. um, now, I know you were, you were in charge of the uh, uh, picture archives at the exactly, Young Institute yeah. for mm -hmm. quite a few years. What, uh, what's in those archives? What, uh, what do they contain? They are containing um, five until 10,000, something like that, uh, paintings made by first the analyzants uh, uh, Jung worked with, and then later... Jung's own analyzants. Yes. Uh, the pictures are in those archives. All right? in those archives. And also uh, all the material collected, gathered uh, by uh, Yolanda Jacobi. Oh, yes. Who was at the origin of the Jung Institute. Yeah. And to start also to create the picture archive. I see. Yeah. So it's a very nice collection uh, yeah. with every picture which is in this uh, picture archive is also uh, photographed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, in a catalog so that one could work uh, I see, with yeah. it. Do people use it a lot? The archive? Unfortunately, they don't. No. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean. Uh, have many Jungian analysts uh, taken great interest in working with art and, and pictures in their practices? Do you know? Fortunately, uh, yes. Yep. Here in uh, Switzerland, there are uh, several, yeah. uh, many. There is a, a tradition uh, to work uh, with the pictures, particularly here in Switzerland. It started with Yolanda Jacobi. Mm -hmm. She wrote also a book she, she wrote on a it. Book, yes, yes. On <laughs> pictures uh, from the unconscious. <coughs> which has been translated into English but never published in, into English. 
So she started the death. Um, then there were uh, Dr. Michel, myself, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Abt. And there's a yeah. kind of a tradition. There's a tradition in yeah, Zurich yeah. of working with pictures. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think Theo Abt has recently published a book exactly, on the yeah, subject uh, as well. Very yeah. good. Uh, yeah. Uh, book uh, giving the different uh, criteria of picture interpretation, yeah, yeah. and um, and uh, also Ingrid Riedel, but unfortunately oh, yes, not sir. published neither in, in German. But it's uh, on the German name title is uh, Kunsttherapy, Art Therapy, uh -huh. where she also summarizes all the different criteria. I think uh, Jung is sometimes credited with being uh, <clears throat> a founder of the art therapy movement, not officially, of course, but one of the first psychotherapists or first important psychotherapists to to work Who, extensively with art. Exactly, and, uh, yeah, what one could say, patients, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that it's uh, exactly the, the case. Uh, yeah. He uh, really worked uh, as one of the first with uh, picture material. Now, I think it was, wasn't it in about 1932 that in this museum right here behind us, there was a famous uh, uh, exposition of Picasso's paintings. Mm -hmm. And Jung came here and looked at it and wrote a review. Yeah. I think his impressions of Picasso at the time, uh, that's published in the collected works. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think of that essay? It's quite controversial. It's very controversial. and. Uh, Probably should, he shouldn't have uh, uh, written it because it's... Uh, <laughs> shouldn't have published it, maybe. <laughs> he sh shouldn't have published it. He himself, in this article, is very careful saying that uh, perhaps it's not uh, uh, exactly um, his speciality, of course. Um, what was uh, so uh, um, criticized was the fact that he um, mentioned that between the language, the formal language of uh, Picasso's art and uh, the schizophrenic painting, uh, yeah. there should be, a, there is a kind of uh, similarity. And uh, of course, he didn't say that uh, Picasso was, was schizophrenic, uh, schizophrenic <laughs> but, but he was misunderstood in that sense. But in a sense, Picasso was representing his age. Uh, he was working in a tradition, and maybe you could say the whole age as a kind of schizophrenia, the collective. Uh, the modern world is somehow split off, split between thinking and feeling, and fragmented, and uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, very much characterized by polarities, oppositions, uh, yeah, yeah. and in this sense, uh, yeah, it was reflected in, in it's reflected the also in the yeah. exactly of, yeah. uh, the, of Picasso, particularly. Yeah. yeah, it's obvious that uh, Jung didn't like Picasso. I yeah. mean, he had another. Well, he didn't like modern art, basically. No, did no, he? I don't yeah. think. Yeah, he was more a traditionalist, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, his taste in art, what would you say, was went to the medieval uh, alchemy pictures or uh, yeah. medieval paintings, that sort of thing. That was his Did This preference. was uh, his preference, uh, the, the naturalistic. Uh, naturalistic, yeah. Uh, he, he painted some himself. Yeah, and he was uh, incredibly uh, gifted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he himself didn't consider himself as an artist, of course. Uh, even if he had a voice reappearing several times, uh, yeah, I think yeah. in his dreams. Yes, yes. Uh, mentioning that he was an artist and he had to, to be very firm. It's <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Saying that it anima. was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kind of a crazy anima. Yeah, uh, but it was an anima. I mean, he he loved he loved exactly, art. He loved yeah. to create art, and he did a lot of it. Yeah. All what his image uh, yeah. had so much importance to him. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, therefore, images, the dreams, of course, on the individual level, but also the uh, symbolism, uh, picture in the collective uh, form, yeah, yeah. Uh, myths, uh, fairy tales. Well, and the Red Book will be published this year, later, uh, I think in the fall, so we see quite a bit of his art, uh, private yeah. art, be made for himself. There are some of his of his uh, paintings uh, from the Red Book already mm -hmm. uh, published, and one can see how uh, gifted he was. Uh, yes, I yeah. mean, they are uh, very impressive, uh, very yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very adequate, uh, accurate uh, illustrations of this inner 
of its inner world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in this sense, it's perhaps not art because it's a direct kind of a very adequate, very precise photographing of inner images in yeah, hand, yeah, yeah. but that's not yet uh, art, not it's a uh, very, it's a... Uh, it depends, I guess, how you define art. What is art? Uh, what, what would you say if somebody asked you, well, what's the definition of art? Yeah, um, I mean, it's uh, to, to work with uh, um, images, particularly coming from uh, the unconscious, yeah, in the psychological. Certainly, yeah. in, in the psychological, the way we work with art. Uh, I was walking through a museum with my son uh, not so long ago, and he pointed at some object that was standing there, and he said, "Now is that art?" And I said to him, "Well, if it's in a museum, it's art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a definition, I guess." <laughs> But uh, it's very hard nowadays to really define what art is. It can be so many things. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, it's, uh, we are far away from the times where art was uh, um, particularly uh, was reduced uh, to or limited to, to yeah. uh, painting. Pretty paintings, nice painting, pictures. Painting or sculpture or art. architecture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, today, art... Um, can also be something which is created by the encounter of the piece yes. and the, the spectator. The spectator, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so it's something which is on the point to be developed together. It's not ah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. the image. It's the, interactive. It's uh -huh. interactive, yeah. Yeah, I think somebody uh, suggested to me uh, not so long ago that uh, what art really does is provoke reflections. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it can do that, if it gets the spectator to enter into a reflection with the artist or with the object, it has done its work. Uh, exactly. Uh, Boys, uh, for instance, had exactly this uh, conception of art. Oh, is that right? It's something uh -huh. which has uh, to give an impulse uh, to, to reflect. To reflect. Yeah. Oh, and he and made the, the fountains. Uh, and yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. To provoke. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, there's quite a bit in the museum behind us that does provoke reflection. There's a very nice uh, permanent collection, and then they have uh, exhibitions from time to time. What do you think about the the collection here in Zurich? Is it's an uh, outstanding uh, collection. Uh, yeah. um, they have uh, a very complete uh, collection of uh, Giacometti, Alberto Giacometti. Giacometti. Oh, yes. Swiss artist. Yeah. Uh -huh. Paul Klee. Paul Clay, yeah. Uh, Segantini, uh, old and uh, modern uh, art. Oh, yes. Also yeah. Chagall, uh, quite a lot. Yeah. Berklin, perhaps Chagall, less yeah. uh, known uh, in yeah. outside of Switzerland. But it's a very big, important uh, museum. Yeah. And here on this place, you see there's a Rodin, the, the gates of the gates of hell. Yeah. And, uh, over here is. Uh, a, uh, Henry, Moore. A Henry Moore and this piece over here. What did you tell me about this one? That's uh, interesting. This has been uh, it's uh, from a Swiss uh, artist, but it has been uh, uh, done in uh, concrete. In concrete. Uh, concrete uh, during uh, one year, one person. One person yeah. had to, to uh, do it according to a kind of a small model. Uh -huh. He created that. Uh, it was very difficult uh, to... Uh, um, well, that certainly uh, to provokes do. some thoughts and reflections. You can look at that for a long time and sort of speculate about what it is. And yeah, uh, it's... Uh, it's dynamic, it moves, it's colorful. Yeah, it's very balanced also. Balanced, it's a different yeah. uh, color. It's something uh, uh, which is very inspiring. Uh, I mean, it suggests a lot of a lightness. It's very heavy, actually, but it kind of floats there, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A bit like an airplane or mm -hmm. something. Well, I hope we uh, have encouraged some of the viewers to come to Zurich and look at the art here and uh, enjoy this place. It's a lovely place to just spend some time when you come to visit ISAP or yeah. or to the Jungian Odyssey, spend a little time looking at art in Zurich. Huh? Yeah, th that's uh, f just for... for Art, it's a, a very interesting place, uh, yep. Zurich. Great. Well, here we are, Paul, in your office now. This is your analytic space, yes. and uh, where you see 
your analysis on a regular basis. Every day you work here, yes, I guess. Yes, yes. Every day. Every day. Well, uh, how long have you been Monday in? to Friday? <laughs> <laughs> and you take a few vacations during yeah, the year. Yeah, <laughs> always. Um, how long have you been in this office? Here in this office, in this place, uh, since uh, for um, 17 years. 17 years yeah. in one place. That's, that's a good, yeah. good spell. <laughs> yeah. And this is also a famous space, mm -hmm. uh, you told me. Yeah, we are here in the working place of uh, Richard Wagner. Yes, Richard Wagner. in this very room. In this very room, yeah. He, what did he write here? Um, he um, didn't compose uh, music. He, he was writing, and he, but I don't remember now what, what he was, he was yeah. working on. Well, why but was he? He did he describe very well all the, the the furniture here. Here was uh, the oven or not the the heating system. Uh -huh. There he had also the table. I say yes. I say uh, green curtains. He liked <laughs> very much. But he considered this all. His uh, dollhouse, he said. His dollhouse. Yeah. And why was he here? He was uh, in exile. He couldn't uh, stay any longer in uh, Dresden, where he was before. Mm -hmm. So he had uh, to flee and to come here to Switzerland. He was helped by quite a lot of uh, people who uh, gave him money, uh, who organized uh, for him even a Swiss, Swiss uh, passport. Oh yes, uh, yeah. not so easy. <laughs> not, not so easy, at least uh, today. I don't know yeah. how it was at that time. Uh, so uh, for him it was very important. He, it forced him to a time where he had more uh, calm. Um, mm -hmm. He was more calm or, uh, or uh, not so busy. Uh, so for him, it was uh, an important time yeah. to, to stay here. In. I think it wasn't he, uh, didn't he fall in love with a woman here uh, who lived up there in the Rietberg and he began yes. writing uh, Tristan and Isolde, I exactly. think, wasn't yeah. it? Uh, I wonder if he composed some of that in this room, do you suppose? I, I don't know, <laughs> I must say. Yeah. Very, very uh, romantic room, yeah. <laughs> full of arrows. Sense, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that brings us I, to... When yeah? there are, uh, sometimes noises because it's an old house more than 150 years old and when there are noises here in the in the wall sometimes I explain to my analyst and where does it come from <laughs> it's still uh, Richard Wagner you imagine uh, uh, some Richard Wagner sounds uh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well opera and theater that's another world of art uh, as I recall, Jung didn't uh, care much for theater, did he? Did he music and opera? Did he? Um... No, this was not something he was uh, particularly uh, interested in. Mm -hmm. He had not uh, such a uh, strong uh, interest or in the music. You think he would have been very interested in Wagner because of the mythological yeah, of motifs course. and all that? And... Uh, Wagner seems uh, to be very close uh, to to, uh, um, to the Jungian. Yeah, I would uh, think. Yeah, yeah. Um, interest of uh, symbolical, mythological um, contents. I think somebody said maybe Mario actually in in the interview last time that uh, uh, music was. Uh, too stirring for him. It stirred him up. It, it moved him too much. Oh, yeah. he, uh, he couldn't take it. He couldn't take a great deal of music, especially mm -hmm. certain kinds of music. Uh, the, well, the, more, the romantic. That, yeah. Yeah. I know that um, he describes that, I think, in his uh, biography, that when he was in uh, Africa and uh, attending a ritual with uh, music and mm -hmm. yes drumming and all yeah. that yeah it was a moment where he felt that uh, now it uh, was uh, too much uh, for him so yeah that, uh, he got it, he got frightened too that exactly uh, yeah, yeah. that it overwhelmed him so, yeah. so it shows also that he had surely uh, uh, openness uh, to the maybe too much uh, too, much, too, uh, too uh, responsive yeah mm -hmm. because wagner is very powerful music and mm -hmm. uh, you can get swept away and in the currents of his leitmotifs and mm -hmm. all of that, yeah. 
Well, you're also uh, involved in theater nowadays. Uh, <laughs> you play the role of, of Jung, actually, in, in a performance. Uh, uh, what's mm -hmm. been your history with theater? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, um, I played uh, here the, the role of uh, Ziggy Jung because uh, not of my particular skills as an uh, actor, but uh, because I have uh, come from Basel mm -hmm. and I have the, the same dialect as a background than the young had uh, so uh, what was that give us a sample of the bosler dialect uh, how did how did young sound uh, with the way he spoke uh, english or uh, the in bosler uh, dialect <laughs> both can you do both. it yeah uh, if you can remember a bit of a letter or something huh? um, what i remember for instance uh, dear victor white let us speak now about your nice letter you wrote me. For instance, that, that's yeah, uh, the with type the, of the, the guttural. Uh, yeah, sound. exactly. I heard from um, uh, Ulrich Hörny and from uh, Peter Jung mm -hmm. after uh, one of our um, uh, theater performances, uh, performances that it sounded uh, quite convincing, you know, <laughs> the way at least that they had in that mind. they remembered, uh, they remembered their grandfather. the sound of her grandfather uh, right, yeah, when yeah. he spoke. Um, I uh, had not the... Uh, well, I heard once uh, Jung speaking also in Basel dialect. Uh, there were a series of uh, cassettes, uh, radio mm -hmm. cassettes. Oh, yes, yeah. Where he spoke a very typical, very pronounced, uh, yeah. um, explicit uh, Basel dialect. That sounded familiar to you. Huh? That uh, sounded very familiar. Yeah. But uh, his Basel dialect was uh, much more authentic than mine because uh, you can distinguish different mm. Basel dialects. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And what, what makes the difference? Uh, well, um, you feel immediately a kind of a social context uh, where a oh, person yeah. comes from. Uh, oh, the very old uh, yeah. Basler is a more bourgeoisie mm -hmm. uh, context. That's the Basler dialect that uh, Jung spoke. I see. Yeah. Uh, mine is a little bit more simple. Uh, more <laughs> simpler. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's interesting about Jung and social class. Uh, he comes from a very old Swiss family on his mother's side, mm -hmm. the Preisswerk, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, old Basler family uh, on his father's side, German, uh, a couple of generations back. Mm -hmm. So, but he identified very strongly with the Swiss side. Do you th do you feel? Yeah, I, I yeah. think uh, he, there was something very typically Swiss uh, yeah. in him. Uh, his. Uh, uh, comes uh, to my mind that just after the war, World War, he was asked if he could also sign uh, an initiative in order to abolish all kind of uh, military or uh, army. Worldwide. Worldwide. Yeah. And he reacted as, and I think that's a kind of a Swiss uh, person in him who uh, answered with a lot of anger, he said uh, that this would be totally unrealistic uh, mm -hmm. to, to think uh, uh, that uh, we could live without any... Um, without war. And, without and, war. And defenses. He, and, and defenses. Yeah, so yeah. he uh, said no. Well, he hands. served in the Swiss army. Um, exactly. As all uh, men of his generation did, and you did too. You were, yeah, you were yeah. in the Swiss army. Yeah. Uh, even though you were a Jesuit, uh, yeah, yeah. For a of time. <laughs> yeah, but I had to, to do my so-called uh, repetition courses every year mm -hmm. for three weeks uh, during a certain uh, period. Uh, I was um, later in the army uh, connected to, uh, or a member of. Uh, Sprachspezialisten uh, detachment. Uh, ah, I see. Uh, specialists in, in language. In languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For Spanish. For Spanish. Yeah. 
Well, you lived in Spain for a while too, didn't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. How long? Yeah. How long did you live there? Uh, only a year. Only one year in Madrid. Year, was it in Madrid? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Do you enjoy Spanish culture and very much? Yeah, language? I have a kind of a connection to the Spanish because uh, I uh, a certain moment in my life I decided uh, to become a Jesuit, uh, who was also an organization founded uh, by, by a Spaniard. By a Spaniard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I liked the uh, Spanish culture very much, but it was uh, through my wife that uh, oh, I was see. Yeah, Spanish. She was Spanish, yeah. yeah. And um, it's unusual in my mind that a, that a Swiss, uh, someone raised in, in Switzerland from a Swiss family in, in Basler, would become a Jesuit. The Jesuits aren't so much at home in Switzerland, are they? No, 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 they, they are not at home at all. Uh, or at that time, mm -hmm. when I entered uh, the Jesuit order, uh, Jesuits were not allowed to, to live in, uh, and work it in Switzerland. It was actually illegal. Uh -huh. It was illegal. Uh -huh. What was very interesting for me <laughs> to join an illegal uh, group. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, some 20 years ago a national vote, a votation, on mm -hmm. this question. And then it was uh, this uh, special article of the national constitution mm. was abolished. So it means that the Jesuits uh, could uh, once again could, uh, work live and, and work live in Switzerland, Switzerland officially. Yeah. But it was the consequence of a kind of a historical, political uh, confrontation between the Catholics and the Protestants. Yeah. And in, uh, remember in Jung's autobiography, he's, uh, he said he was very afraid of a Jesuit who walked <laughs> down the road. Uh, exactly. In Basel, wasn't it? Uh, but later uh, he, uh, of course, uh, worked also uh, with uh, uh, a particular two uh, Jesuits, uh, yeah. Josef Rudin and uh, Hugo Rahner. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, he overcame his fear of the Jesuits. <laughs> Apparently <laughs> overcame his fear. Yeah. Uh, and I remember there's a letter in the, his correspondence with Victor White where he's actually, he gets in bed with an old Jesuit, doesn't he? Do you remember that letter? No, I don't remember that. <laughs> How was that? He dreams that he uh, he's in a, a, a place like a barracks and uh, there are Jesuits all around and uh, he uh, he's going to sleep there, but there aren't enough beds. So there's an old Jesuit who says he'll share a bed with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wakes up just as he's about to enter this bed with the Jesuit. And uh, Victor White writes back to him and um, uh, I think is, is, has the feeling that Jung is on the verge of a conversion experience to, uh, oh, yeah. to the Catholic oh, yeah. Church, mm -hmm. which, which Jung then, of course, mm -hmm denies completely. He was not interested in becoming a Catholic, but he was very interested in the Catholic religion as a symbol, symbol system and, mm -hmm. and its theology and so on. But and he uh, gave uh, at the ETH a very interesting uh, seminar uh, on um, the spiritual exercises uh, oh, yes, of right. uh, uh, Ignatius, mm -hmm. the founder of the Jesuit order. Yeah. Uh, well, in your performance of uh, uh, the, Vic the, the the young white letters, uh, uh, I've I've watched it many times now in rehearsal and in performance, and it gets better and better. I, I remember when we did it in London, uh, someone came up to me after the uh, performance and said it was like being there with these two men, Young and Victor White. You really get into the role, and uh, mm -hmm. how has that been for you? I mean, uh, do you, do you feel yourself? Possessed by Jung when you do those letters, or yeah, I must say it's incredible how one enters. I mean, the text in, uh, itself, uh, yeah. the, the letters are very impressive, and uh, it's the whole story is very moving. And uh, this uh, yeah. tragic uh, and deep uh, uh, friendship um, uh, between the two persons. Uh, so it helps uh, really to enter in this uh, the, the the quality and the depth. Yeah, these letters to enter in the in the vivid uh, human reality of uh, these uh, two persons. Yes. So I, I felt uh, really entering uh, <laughs> very much in it, and that's very convincing. Yeah, yeah, very convincing. Mm -hmm. And and uh, 
the audience that is watching this interview will also have the opportunity to see the performance, I think, in, in September, we hope to be able to broadcast that mm -hmm. also to the United States. So uh, look forward to seeing okay. you yeah. then. Yeah. Enroll. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul, we are in probably one of the most sacred of all <laughs> the Jungian places in the world. Uh, by special permission, we are uh, in the psychological club of Zurich, where uh, Jung lectured and taught for many years. Um, all the old Jungians passed through here, first generation. This is the very room where Jung gave his famous seminars, mm -hmm. Zarathustra, vision seminars, pictures, all those uh, seminars that have now been published. Um, uh, are you a member of the Psychological Club? It still continues to this day and uh, has a regular program of lectures and... No, I uh, intend from time to time lectures offered here in the Psychological Club, but I'm not uh, uh, member today. I have been uh, during a certain time, uh, during mm -hmm. 80 years, I have been a member of uh, the club. Being a member of the curatorium, the, there see, was yeah. a special link between the yeah, yeah. curatorium and the club. Because uh, the Jung Institute was uh, created, founded by the club. By the club, yes. The club has been here since uh, since its founding, basically, in 19, 1918, 1920, in there somewhere, and uh, has been functioning regularly ever since. Um, and it was it functioned as a kind of uh, uh, training institute of sorts mm -hmm. in its day when Jung was lecturing here. Uh, people would come and listen to his lectures exactly, yeah, yeah. And, and analysis with him. Mm -hmm. He had an office right in this building. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, the um, uh, I think training, as it was considered in those days, was very informal. You worked with Jung, you listened to some lectures, or with one of the mm -hmm. uh, one of his immediate disciples here, mm -hmm. and, um, and you got a piece of paper, exactly a right. letter. Uh, the role uh, of the personal analyst was very important. Personal analyst was yeah, yeah. yeah. and. Um, there were no uh, questions of numbers, how often how many uh, hours uh, you had to, to present <laughs> your cases and examinations. So, uh, it was um, um, a time where we can perhaps have some nostalgic feelings about. <laughs> well, why did why did Jung found the club? Uh, what what was his intention? To have a, a public uh, to for just a. Um, presenting also his ideas, mm -hmm. but it was also uh, to, to create a possibility for analysis of his, and uh, later also the other... Uh, a kind of social network. A social uh, network, uh, exactly, yeah, a community, for all yeah. these uh, people having a personal interest in Jungian psychology through their own analytical experience, and in order to, to bring together these people and also uh, have social activities. Social activities were a very important part of it. I, I, one, one reads in the biographies and so on about uh, parties that they would have yeah. here, Christmas party or Fasnacht parties, quite wild mm -hmm. parties in those days, costumes. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, uh, these uh, uh, Social aspects uh, still are valid today in the psychological club. There is also always a Christmas or a yeah. meeting, or a dinner. A, it's a dinner, a dinner yeah, or yeah. it's an excursion. Excursions, so this yeah. uh, aspect is still alive. Now, if somebody wants to become a member of the psychological club, what do they do? How do they? How could you become a member of this organization? Um, well, you you have uh, to. Uh, uh, have someone from the club recommending mm -hmm. uh, you. Um, I personally had to give uh, a lecture here mm -hmm. uh, to uh, show your credentials. <laughs> exactly. 
and apparently I was you passed. Uh, I passed. Yeah. I did the same thing when I moved over here uh, mm -hmm. to Switzerland uh, five years ago. I also gave a lecture and became a member of the club, and it's uh, it's been a very nice nice experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Jungians uh, often have a reputation for being very individualistic, not not much uh, interest in community and uh, social life. They're introverted. They focus on themselves and their dreams and their inner processes. How important do you think it is for for Jungians to have social contact with each other? I think it's very important to, to have such an opportunity, uh, and I'm. Uh, I've been very often as uh, surprised to see that, in spite of this uh, reputation to be very uh, introvert, uh, Jungians uh, have a sense also for uh, coming together as an institution to be uh, involved in a training program. Mm -hmm. When I compare here in Switzerland, uh, for instance, uh, with uh, other institutes uh, from other uh, orientations, it's uh, uh, they have much more problems to, to find people uh, that right? really yeah. Uh, yeah. involved uh, to be being involved ready in, yeah. to mm -hmm. do something for this uh, uh, community mm -hmm. uh, or institution for a training program. So, in spite of the <laughs> reputation of introversion, uh, there is a sense for uh, sharing and cooperating together. But it isn't always without conflict and problems. Uh, the, I know the Psychological Club itself has, has had plenty of controversies throughout its now quite long history. In fact, at one point, I think Jung even withdrew from mm -hmm. the club for a couple of years because he didn't like what was going on. And Jungians all over the world go through this process of forming organizations and then splitting and new organizations. What, what's your view on that? Is that a good thing? Is it creative? Does it have some positive function or is it um, kind of unresolved pathologies in these introverts who don't know how to really get along too yeah. well with each other? Apparently it's unavoidable. I mean, uh we were so proud here in Switzerland uh, during a long time to be uh, uh, to form together a union group with, where there were different tendencies, of course, but, but uh, where the the readiness to maintain a unity was uh, very much alive. Catholic, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, finally, uh, we have uh, now here in Zurich three different um, <laughs> institutions. Uh, we have uh, the Jung Institute, uh, we have uh, ISAP, we have um, the Training Center, uh, Front France uh, Training mm -hmm. Center. So th that's perhaps also an expression, the last result of uh, uh, vitality. Um, and uh, we try at the same time to bring together again. Try to cooperate. To, to cooperate uh, between yeah. these uh, different uh, uh, institutions. Uh, we have the think tank, you were very yeah. much involved yourself. Yeah, yeah. Trying to get some level of dialogue going and cooperation. Mm -hmm. Now the psychological club where we're, where we're sitting um, is, uh, is the oldest Jungian institution in the world, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, it has never split, uh, actually, although there's been internal conflict and difficulties. Sometimes people would leave, but um, it has really maintained its, uh, its uh, integrity over all these years. I think that's a pretty good sign for mm -hmm. uh, a level of, um, I don't know, um, being able to work together over a long period of time and maintain one's economic mm -hmm. position. The club has, uh, is not wealthy, but it manages to continue uh, functioning and it has an active membership. So I guess there is both. There's the tendency to split and divide and form new groups with new tendencies. Uh, also, some groups continue over long periods of time. I think uh, one has also to see that uh, 
a psychological club, for instance, doesn't offer a training. Right. Yeah. So uh, there are not uh, um, power uh, aspects uh, which can so easily enter when mm -hmm. you are involved as a training analyst uh, or yeah. when you are involved in, in training as such. Uh, it's a, it creates the opportunity for having regularly, on a regular basis, um, exchanges um, to get uh, interesting uh, lectures, mm -hmm. uh, but without any uh, idea to give a diploma. Yeah. So... Uh, oh, it's really a club. It's a club, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it continues to function that way. Well, in addition to Jung, of course, there were other well-known Jungian uh, speakers and lecturers here over the years. Emma Jung gave Emma lectures. Jung. Um, Kareny. Kareny, yeah. Uh, I think Portman, all those who the, were uh, also at Eranos. The Eranos people. I think um, um, Martin Buber mm -hmm. lectured here in the early 20s. Uh, I think uh, some writers have been here. Um, uh, what's his name? They famous Swiss novelist, uh, Siddhartha uh, uh, Hesse? Hesse, Hermann Hesse, I think uh, gave a, a, a lecture on Siddhartha before the book was actually published mm -hmm. here, and uh, religious figures, so on. Um, Pauli also. Uh, Pauli was, um, I think, a member of the club. Mm -hmm. He was a founding member of the Jung Institute. Exactly. Yeah. Wolfgang Pauli, the physicist. Yeah. So it's a long and distinguished history. There is a bust of Jung over there in the corner. Do you know who made that figure? Unfortunately, no, I don't know. It's, uh, I think it was a Swiss artist from Geneva. I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. But it's one of the only busts of Jung that I know of. Do you know of others? No, I, I, it's, uh, yeah. uh, I think uh, really the, the only one. We have other and uh, drawing. Have there's a drawing by Barbara Hanna over here in this corner. And then, of course, Marie-Louise von Franz, who is right behind me, uh, was a very important figure in the club and in the, in the institute uh, mm -hmm. during our days when, when we trained here. She yeah, was, we, we heard uh, lectures. Uh, brilliant lecture. Brilliant, yeah, yeah, yeah. which uh, later were published in the form of books. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's a great uh, moment, a great privilege to uh, be here and uh, show this space to our to our viewers. And we want to thank Andrea Schweitzer mm -hmm. for letting us come in here. Who is, he's yeah. the president of the club today. So thank you thank very you. much. Okay. You. Mm -hmm. It's been nice, Paul. Yeah. <laughs>
it'll just take a, a second or so to get this around and then Paul can step off the stage and I'll uh, let me see I'll make myself a little bigger like this and maybe go back this way a bit how's that okay so you can see me and I can see you hi um, I want to um, begin this uh, uh, exposition of the fourth pillar of um, Jungian analysis, active imagination, by just briefly reviewing the other three that we've already covered. Um, those of you who are with us in these seminars, uh, this will be a, a little bit repetitious, I won't spend much time on it, but I want to weave together uh, the four so that you get the, the feeling that it's a coherent method and uh, it doesn't just have these different parts but they really work together. Uh, the four pillars as Steve mentioned, uh, the first one uh, that we we discussed a year ago is individuation. The concept of individuation as a lifelong psychological psychological slash spiritual uh, developmental process in the person, in the personality and I say lifelong basically in two stages, the first half of life and the second half of life. The first half focusing on the, the growth of the ego, the second half on the development of the ego self connection. Uh, we elucidated all of that and discussed it, so I'm not going to go into any details about it. But that is a theoretical piece. Uh, it's a vision, I would say. It's a vision of human potential, of what the human being can fully become under certain conditions under certain aspects given that the individual sets out to go on this journey and to work on herself or himself uh, what is possible in terms of the individuation process and this concept of individuation is in the back of of the Jungian analysts of the Jungian psychotherapist's mind when he or she sits down with an individual who comes for help and that the client uh, is assessed in a sense, in an ongoing way, not in a diagnostic way, but in an ongoing way as to where they are in this individuation process, what perhaps their deficits are, what they have not done, what they need to do, and so on. So this is a developmental idea that's in the back of the mind of the Jungian therapist as, as they work with individuals. Uh, and then the tools with which they work uh, are these other three pillars uh, and those were uh, outlined as uh, the transference counter transference process or the therapeutic relationship which I uh, discussed with you and, and with the help of Mario Jacoby in our second uh, pillar seminar and the relationship that develops between the analyst and the analysand uh, right from the beginning and, and goes in any number of possible directions in the course of their work together is the background in which everything else takes place. Everything that happens in analysis takes place within the context of this relationship and the Jungian analyst is trained to pay attention to what's going on in that relationship. If it starts going off course to try to fix it and bring it back, uh, if it's going in certain directions that um, involve uh, strong projections that really tie deeply into emotions, into complexes, into what we call archetypal dimensions, the collective unconscious. The, the analyst is aware of that and can spot it perhaps in dreams and in certain kinds of reactions that take place within the, within the interactive field and also to observe and keep track of what we call counter-transference, the feelings and reactions that are taking place within his or her own subjectivity in response to uh, this particular person and what's going on in their dynamic relationship. And that's a very important part of the of, uh, underlying uh, motivation for development. Uh, some people attribute the healing that can take place within an analytic process to that uh, therapeutic relationship. Uh, at any rate, the Jungians feel it's very important to, to know about it, to study it, to understand it, and to be able to use it productively and creatively and, and with consciousness uh, in the therapeutic setting. So that was the second pillar that we, we discussed at some length and referred you to other readings. So much one could say about that. And, and students at ISAP and other training institutes spend a lot of time thinking and reflecting 
uh, on that as they do their training and under supervision with their cases and so on. And then the third pillar that we discussed, uh, John Hill was with me in that uh, seminar, uh, is working with dreams, the interpretation of dreams. As dreams uh, appear spontaneously or by request of the analyst, sometimes with some nudging or some encouragement, uh, dreams come into the process uh, that unfolds in the course of analysis and that uh, Jungians generally feel that dreams bring a lot of very important information um, about the, the, the process that's going on in the, in, the, in the moment with the analysand, but also about the history of the analysand, about the deep structures underlying the analysand subjectivity, uh, showing the, the structure of complexes, but at bottom, most importantly of all, showing what the unconscious is trying to do to evolve itself, to grow itself. So Jung would sometimes was quoted as saying or has written, not so interested in what the dream figures show me about the complexes of the patient. What I'm really interested in is what is the dream maker trying to do with these complexes? Where is it trying to go? And to spot that underlying tendency that's moving toward growth and development. Uh, it's the essential, uh, in my mind, that's the essential um, uh, point that the Jungian analyst is trying to keep an eye out for and, and trying to spot, and over a series of dreams to try to keep track of that and see where it's going and to try to integrate some of that material, bring it more into consciousness and into the light of day and connect it up with the analysand's conscious functioning. Now, the fourth pillar, active imagination, um, is a feature of Jungian work that, in my mind, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, I'd say, the last 50 years, uh, fell away to some extent from the centrality of Jungian practice. And there were many reasons for this in the history of the, of the growth of the field of analytical psychology, and I'll, I'll mention some of those things. But I would say in the last five or six, five, maybe even ten years, it's been making a comeback. And um, I want to emphasize it as one of the main features of, of, of Jungian work in whatever form it takes, and there are various forms that active imagination can take, as you will hear. Um, and the reason for that is that it is really the, the key to opening up a dialectical interaction with, between conscious and unconscious aspects of the psyche. And I'll say some more about the, the theoretical uh, reasons that, that Jung felt it was so important to include active imagination within uh, his analytic practice. Um, so to begin this exposition, if you will, uh, about active imagination, I would like to speak about Jung's own experience, his discovery of active imagination as a tool for working with himself in the first instance, and then for working with his uh, patients and analysands in the second, and why he felt it was so important. Um, I will also, I would encourage you if you're really interested in this subject to, to get this book. Um, it's entitled Jung on Active Imagination. It's a, it's a collection of Jung's writings on the subject of active imagination. You can see there isn't that much. It isn't a big book. It's a book of about 200 pages. Uh, introduced and edited by Joan Chodorov. Joan Chodorov is a Jungian analyst in San Francisco, and she's done a marvelous job sifting through the collected works and pulling together everything important that Jung himself said about active imagination. She writes a marvelous, brilliant introduction to it and gives a long list of references uh, for further reading and study afterwards. So if you're really interested in pursuing this further, I think that's a very good place to start with that book. Um, the I gave a phrase to this section. I want to say uh, Jung, the pioneer, uh, discoverer of active imagination, from crisis to living myth. From crisis to living myth. Because his, his 
uh, uh, beginning uh, use of active imagination came during one of the major crises of his life, uh, psychological, emotional crises. It was after his, his departure from psychoanalysis, his break with Freud, or just close to the end of his, uh, his active participation and relationship with Freud. And it was a period in his life, it was his midlife crisis in his, in his mid to late 30s uh, that he calls confrontation with the unconscious in his autobiography. And in his autobiography, he describes how he, um, how he began using active imagination to work on himself, to work on his own emotional issues. Because he was, um, during that early, in that period of time, he felt very disoriented he felt like he'd really lost himself. Uh, he felt like he had gone down, down a road that uh, wasn't working for him. Uh, psychoanalysis carried with Freud and the Freudian, in the Freudian way and the Freudian method with uh, uh, free association and interpretation of dreams and interpretation of childhood and all of that um, carried him a good distance into the into his work with his patients and work on himself and the unconscious, but at a certain point he felt it let, it let him down and he had really lost his way. And um, Steve mentioned that the Red Book is going to be published this fall. The Red Book is the story of his active imaginations uh, during this period of time from about 1912 to about uh, 1920. Um, and it, the, the, the first sentence of the Red Book is, um, uh, has to do with, I'm searching for my soul. I've lost my soul and I want to find it again. So his, uh, his feeling at the end of this period with Freud was that he'd lost his soul. Uh, that means that he'd lost his feeling, he'd lost touch with himself. He'd gotten uh, sidetracked or he'd gone down a road that didn't feel right to him in the end. And he needed to retrace his steps, get back in touch with himself, find out who he was and maybe rediscover a new direction. And so that's, that's the point at which he began to delve into, you could say, his creative imagination. And the way he describes it is uh, in, in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, a few other places where he talks about this, is that he felt um, like an inner pressure, an inner urge uh, to um, uh, say something, to think something, to let something happen in himself, to let something enter into his subjectivity that on the one hand he was afraid of, of letting go of control, of the ego's control. He was afraid of, of entering into a territory he didn't know what it was or what it contained. And he'd seen his patients get lost, his schizophrenic patients get lost in their fantasies. He'd he, this was 1912. He'd just written a book called, uh, um, called now, uh, uh, Symbols of Transformation. The, uh, the, um, uh, it's a study of a case of a, of a woman, a woman, mind you, named Frank Miller. First name was Frank. But it is a, a case of a woman who he felt was getting lost in her, in her fantasies and in, in lost control of her directed thinking and was on the verge of a schizophrenic break, and he felt the same thing happening to himself. Uh, having lost his soul, having lost his direction, he was afraid of losing his mind. And so there was this, this inner pressure to um, think some thoughts, imagine some things, he didn't know what it was. Uh, and finally, it reached the point where he says, he was sitting at his desk one day, and he said, okay, I'm just gonna let myself go. I'm going to let it come what wants to come, what needs to come, and I'll see what it is and see if I can deal with it. So it was a very risky moment in his experience. He didn't really know what was going to happen to him. And I mean, it, it looks a little strange for us because we're familiar with this territory, but he wasn't. He, and and uh, uh, he didn't really know what would pop out of the closet when he opened the door. So he said he was sitting at his desk one day at his, in his home in Kusnacht, and he looks out the window and he sees the lake, he closes his eyes and sees what happens. And he says, uh, well, the first thing I felt was that I was floating. I was floating in the air and I was somewhere in space. Now that's that feeling of disorientation, dislocation, you, 
betwixt and between, liminality, don't know where you are, floating. And then he says, I felt myself floating and then falling, and then I was falling down the side of a mountain or a hill. Bump, 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 falling down the hill. And then in my imagination, I come to a stop and I pick myself up and I look around. And I look around and in the, in the imagination now, I look around, what do I see? Well, he saw the side of a hill, familiar territory, looks like Switzerland. Uh, Young loved to hike in the mountains and it was, he, he loved to camp out and he was quite outdoors type. Uh, so there he is, and he looks up the side of the hill, and he sees uh, a cave. And so he starts crawling up the side of the hill, and he looks into the cave. Uh, and inside the cave, he says, I saw a fire, a fire burning in there. And I saw, then I saw a couple of figures uh, uh, standing around the fire, and I looked more closely. And in there I saw that it was an old man and a pretty young woman standing there, warming themselves by the fire. He didn't know what to do with that. He looked at it, he saw it, and then he said the most amazing thing happened. And this is when you can tell that active imagination is beginning. Uh, the figures speak back. He said, I thought I'd ask them what their names were. And they talked back. And when that happens, when the figure talks back, it's, it's a little scary because you think, what is this now? Uh, what's going to happen? They're autonomous figures. And he said, the amazing thing was that they named themselves. They told me who they were. And uh, the old man said his name was Elijah. And the young woman said her name was Salome. So that was the surprise. And uh, then he looked a little further into the cave and he said, in the corner, I saw a black snake. And I thought, well, that's, that's enough for me today. I think I'll just back out of here. He was a little afraid of that snake. So then he took control, His, he, he was awake, he took control and he stopped it. At that point, uh, the ego took charge, he'd had enough. He said, now I'll just make a note of that and um, and wait a while. So I'm sure he turned it over in his mind and a few days later he thought, well that was interesting, it wasn't overwhelming, I didn't lose my mind, maybe I'll go back and see what happens next. And so it went. So the next day, uh, a few days later, he went back and gradually he got to know these figures and they started telling him things and he became familiar with them. Uh, and Every time he did that for a period of time, uh, he would write down in, a, in his notebooks uh, what this conversation was and what was developing. So it developed into a narrative, into a story. Uh, and then, uh, and he felt that um, this was very interesting and it somehow soothed him. It had a soothing uh, effect on his, on his emotions to be in touch with this material. Well, then he, uh, having recorded it in his, uh, in what were called the black books, the black notebooks, he made another decision. And that decision was to um, spend more time on this material, actually to give it a lot of attention. Uh, he bought himself what's now called the red book. It's a book about, you know, about this size, a good size folio book uh, with a leather cover. Uh, good quality paper inside, and then he started making a selection from the black books, from the notebooks, and writing in a very precise uh, script with a special pen and special ink and all of that, really devoting himself to this, and you'll see it in the red book when it's published in, in uh, October, uh, and, and very careful lines on the page, and including in, included in that book uh, the most masterful um, uh, calligraphy and, uh, you know, if you've ever seen medieval manuscripts, illuminated manuscripts, the first letter of a paragraph will be this brilliant, brilliantly colored uh, 
background with a letter A or something like that. And, and, he's, and he put that in the book. And so you can see how much time and effort he put into this work, this inner work, on his fantasies. We call it the inner life now. What he had discovered, as Michael Fordham once told me, that most, Jung's most important discovery was the inner life, the inner world. He discovered an inner world. And the inner world was made up of these characters, these figures who emerged uh, in his imaginations and whom he could engage and go back to and carry on conversations and dialogues with. And uh, gradually some of these figures changed over the years. Elijah became Philemon, and Philemon later changed his name to Ba. And all of this is, is recorded in his autobiography. I don't need to go into any details. You can read about it there. But the point I'm making is that what, un the, what unfolded through this process, this engagement with his imagination, was a, um, uh, a narrative, a story, and a set of figures, dialogues, that he felt really put him back in touch with himself. He had found his soul. Started out asking himself, where is my soul? I need to find it. And through this process that went on for many years, uh, he says it basically reached its climax and culmination in 1928 with a great dream, a Liverpool dream. Uh, he uh, really started, uh, you could say he discovered his, his myth. He discovered his myth, which is the inner world. He called it the, uh, the world of the self. Um, and active imagination was the doorway into it and the way to engage it. It was a combination of active imagination and working with dreams. And sometimes they're, you know, they're conjoined. A dream will lead to an active imagination or a dream will comment on an active imagination. Uh, and so you get this series of uh, imaginal materials made up of dreams and active imagination that is really the content of the Red Book. Plus all the amazing paintings that he put in, mandala paintings and drawings and a lot of these pictures you've seen already from other, uh, uh, they've been excerpted in, in books by other people. It's all in the Red Book. Now, there were two key principles that were involved in this process. And uh, the first one is what he called Geschehenlassen. Geschehenlassen is a German word, long word, made up of a couple of words, it means to let it happen. Letting it happen, Geschehenlassen to let something just happen. And he discovered that there is an equivalent in Chinese philosophy to Geschehen lesson. Geschehen lesson was his German word for it. And when he made his uh, contact with Richard Wilhelm, and Richard Wilhelm sent him this magnificent text of the secret of the golden flower, Jung discovered that the Chinese had also been doing active imagination in an alchemical fashion, using alchemical ideas and images. Uh, and their expression, their word for Geshean lesson was Wu Wei, W U W E I, Wu Wei. And Wu Wei means the same thing. It means to let it happen. In other words, not to exert a rational or ego control over the uh, uh, imagination, to be present consciously in the act of imagination as an I, as an ego, but not to control it. So it's, it's like uh, being in a good conversation that you don't control, right? You participate in it. Uh, you let the conversation happen. That's a real dialogue. You know, if you have to control the conversation, it's a, you know, you're the boss and, and they're the subordinate, that's not a dialogue, that's giving instructions or it's listening to instructions. Uh, if you're with a controlling person, you can't have a dialogue. But if you can sit and listen to them and let something happen and then respond to it and give your part and let something else come back, that's Gushayan lesson. That's Wu Wei. And Jung discovered that by doing this with his own inner figures, a process developed. That process we call active imagination. That interaction between the ego and the figures that emerge from the unconscious and show their autonomy and their reality. So the first principle was Wu Wei or Geshean lesson. And the second principle, very important one, uh, that Jung discovered uh, just by 
experimentation and that we use now as sort of basic rule, say of active imagination, we could say is stay with the image that emerges. Whatever comes, whatever image comes, stick with it. Uh, don't second guess it. Don't try to improve it. Don't try to uh, find something else. Uh, take the image that comes and stay with that image. I call it fidelity. Fidelity to the process. Stay with the process that comes to you. Don't look for somebody else's process. Don't look for a more ideal process, more wonderful process. If you start doing that in active imagination, the whole thing will fall apart. The critic ego takes over. Nothing's ever good enough or interesting enough. And so nothing can develop. It's like some guy trying to find the perfect woman. You'll never find the perfect woman in this world. You know, there's always a little flaw. There's always something not quite right. She's not, a, can't cook as good as mother. Or she, you know, when she doesn't have her makeup on, she isn't so pretty, whatever. There's always something wrong. So finally, you've got to settle for love, okay, uh, instead of the perfection that you're looking for. So what comes uh, in the way of images, stick with it fidelity to the image. And if you look at Jung's examples of active imagination, that's exactly what he did. It was Elijah and uh, Salome who first appeared. It was to Elijah and Salome that he returned and continued his dialogues. And from that, the whole process uh, unfolded. Um, so uh, from crisis to living myth, what I mean by living myth is that what Jung discovered through this inner work were a set of, uh, I'd say, uh, um, continuities, uh, consistencies, uh, something that was reliable and consistent within him uh, that he could go back to and that he discovered uh, could nurture him. What a, what a living myth does, if, you're, if you've got one, it gives your life meaning. It's a container. It, it gives your life coherence. I mean, when you're down and out and you think life isn't worth living, it's some place you can go for some comfort and some consolation. It's what religious people do when they go into a church and they pray because they believe God is really there. And, uh, you know, they may be helpless and worthless and useless, but God will help them. That's a living myth. It's a place you can go that will give you assistance in time of, of need and trouble and give your life meaning and a context, a bigger context than just your own personal feelings at the moment. And I think that's what Jung discovered through active imagination and working with his dreams. In this inner world, he discovered that there was a myth uh, for him that he could live, that made sense to him, and that gave his life direction and meaning. So uh, having started in crisis, disorientation, disillusionment, lost, he came to a place where he felt that his life was contained in a myth, that he had a direction, and he had something to say to the world. Um, that would be, uh, I think, Jung's testimonial to the value of, uh, of uh, active imagination. Just one more thing before we take some questions. Uh, if you look at Jung's cases, that is, the cases that he wrote up or that people wrote about working with Jung, you will inevitably find evidence of active imagination. I, uh, I, I, I just made a, a short list. Um, if you want to read about a case, uh, a woman who worked with Jung uh, named Tina Keller, uh, she worked with Jung from 1915 to 1928, basically, in those critical years. And uh, she wrote about her experience with Jung, and uh, Wendy Swan has taken her notes and put together a very interesting article uh, about Tina Keller's analysis with Jung and Tony Wolf, the combination. And uh, she tells a lot about what it was like to work with Jung in those years. That's in the Journal of Analytical Psychology, the year 2006, volume four. Uh, if you want to read about it. So uh, there you'll see uh, in a very vivid way how, how a patient experienced Jung and how active imagination played a role in that work. Then uh, a couple, three cases that Jung wrote about extensively. 
uh, which contain huge amounts of active imagination material, uh, I would say it's really central to the case, probably the most important feature of these cases. Christiana Morgan was a patient of Jung's uh, in the late 1920s. Uh, she was a, uh, an American woman who worked with Jung uh, for a period of six months or so, not a long, long period of time. But she produced a lot of imagination, a lot of images, a lot of uh, material that Jung then lectured on in the early 1930s, and that's been published. It's called The Visions Seminars, The Visions Seminars. Um, Christiana Morgan went on to work with Henry Murray, and they created the thematic apperce apperception test at Harvard in the 1930s and 40s. Very important patient of Jung's. And then there was Christine Mann. Christine Mann, again, an American woman, a psychiatrist who came to work with Jung in the 1920s. And um, Jung published her uh, material at her, uh, of course, at, with her permission. Uh, it's called um, A Study in the Process of Individuation. It's found in Collected Ver Works, Volume 9, 1, A Study in the Process of Individuation. And there you see, again, how um, uh, important making pictures, as Paul will talk about later, painting pictures, doing active imagination, elaborating on her dreams and active imagination, and this combination, this mixture of dream material and active imagination woven together really is at the core of her process, and Jung calls it a study in the process of individuation. It's one of his great cases. A third case, not really so much an analytic case, but a case that Jung studied in careful detail is the case of Wolfgang Pauli. And Wolfgang Pauli was a, a very well-known intellectual in Zurich. He taught not at this university, the University of Zurich, but at the ETH, the Technical University here, the same university that Einstein graduated from and where Jung was a professor in the 1930s. And Wolfgang Pauli produced a series of 400 dreams, uh, 400 dreams and uh, what he calls um, uh, imaginations, that is active imagination. And Jung reduced that to 100 essential ones and he wrote a, <clears throat> wrote a commentary on it and that's published in uh, Psychology and Alchemy, volume 12 of the collected works. Again, there you see the key role that active imagination played in that process. And for many years, I, I just, I didn't pay too much attention to it, but then I went back and I looked, and I was amazed to see that the culmination of that series in what is called the world clock image, the world clock dream, I always thought it was a dream, actually wasn't a dream. It was an imagination. It was a Pauli imagination that was a culmination at that period of his life, the 1930s, he lived until about 1958, uh, and he continued recording his dreams for his whole life. Um, but in that period, that uh, moment, that was really a breakthrough moment, a moment uh, that Jung calls equivalent to a conversion experience, a moment of transformation of consciousness, came about in, uh, in an act of imagination. And uh, Pauli gives his testimonial to that. And then finally, Joe Henderson. Joe Henderson, uh, an American analyst very well known, one of the founders of the Jung Institute in San Francisco, worked with Jung in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s. And uh, he did some very impressive paintings and active imaginations that he kept for his lifetime. He, he painted some mandalas, not copying Jung. They were his own material but he painted them in a mandala form and he kept them in his office and I think they've been published in some of his books. And just a final thing before we have some questions, Joe Henderson told me that when he, he worked with Jung, uh, this would have been in the early 1930s, 31, 32 and there somewhere, many of the people who came to see Jung would come in the summertime and they'd stay at a special hotel in Kusna called the Hotel Zona. And uh, there's a balcony at the Hotel Zona right on the lake, it's very pretty. And uh, Joe Henderson said, if you'd go out on that balcony on a, uh, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning for your breakfast, you'd see all the patients out there writing down their dreams, doing active imagination, making paintings. They were all engaged in it, okay? Active imagination was the standard. Uh, you had to have dreams, you had to do active imagination. If you couldn't produce those things, you probably, you know, Jung would have been 
unhappy, or you would have been unhappy, but it really was at the core of Jungian practice in Jung's time. Jung believed in it. He, he grounded himself in it. He thought, this really worked for me. I think it'll work for my patients too. And I think most of his patients probably practiced it. After the questions, I'll say something about uh, contemporary forms of uh, active imagination, how it's changed a bit over the years. So why don't we go to the sites, if you want to turn on your microphones, and I'll take about 10 minutes of questions. We could start with Asheville if you have something there. Well, I've got it. Um, Roy, my question would be, how much active imagination are you personally doing in your analytical you know, cases? And if so, how do you introduce active imagination to patients as you begin that kind of work? Okay. Um, I'll go. Uh, I'll leap ahead of myself a bit. Uh, I was going to comment on that a bit later, but uh, active imagination uh, was classically used in in a couple of ways, and I, I do the same. Uh, it uh, it's a it's a great way to help people become uh, independent of the analyst to, to overcome the transference dependency because active imagination is done on their own and they can continue the process when they are in the presence of the analyst and uh, in Jung's day people would come for uh, a period of time and then leave for a period of time and come back and and in that intervening time they would keep the process going with active imagination so classically it's used toward the end of analysis in order to facilitate the termination process. So that's one way I use it. And I will introduce it uh, by teaching people how to do it. I have a couple of basic rules about how to do it, how to, uh, rules to follow and, and uh, how to set it up and how to keep it going. And then they'll bring the results to me. They do it on their own. They bring the results to me and we discuss them. With some people, I start it much earlier. Uh, here in Zurich, I work with people sometimes who are here for a year or so. Some, some students who come here for a limited period of time, and I want to give them the, the Jungian experience, the Zurich experience, so to speak. So I'll work with dreams and I'll introduce active imagination very early on. When I, where I don't use active imagination, and this is, this is the cautionary part of it, is if somebody's ego is not strong enough to, to manage a confrontation with the unconscious. In other words, if somebody is seriously uh, uh, given to um, you know, quasi quasi uh, schizophrenic breaks or serious psychopathology or is, is overwhelmed already with material from dreams or emotional material that they, they just couldn't take on anything more. I mean, it's sort of a crisis situation. I stay away from active imagination. Active imagination I see as more and a part of the ongoing analytic process that extends over a period of time. It's not an intervention for a crisis, a moment of crisis, typically. It might be in some cases, uh, but uh, I don't use it that way. Is that enough, Steve? We can we could talk some more about this. But... Yeah, I appreciate that. If you could, at some point, it doesn't have to be now, but I'd love to hear those rules that you mentioned of when you're instructing a, a client how to do act imagination. I'd love if you could give us at some point five or ten minutes of, you know, this is what I say to patients, this is how we do it, these are the rules per se. Maybe you're planning on doing that. Yeah, I can do that. Already, I, I can do that. I can do it in a very in a very brief way. I'll do it in my in my next segment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other Asheville questions? Anybody? Okay. Come on down, sir. We have one more question in Asheville, and then we'll move to another site. How would one use a dream? journal in active imagination. Can you say that again, please? How would you use a dream journal in active imagination? How would you use a dream journal? Well, um, you do it this way. You um, active, I would take active imagination and, and a, a be, be flexible about it. Uh, some people uh, do active imagination while walking. Uh, I found that to be very helpful myself. Take a walk in a place where you don't have to look out for the traffic and you can you know, just focus on your look inward and while you're moving. 
uh, let let images come and have inner dialogues and conversations. Uh, some people do it uh, through uh, writing. Uh, it's it's uh, so it could be a part of your journaling. You know, you write a sentence and uh, the other figure writes a sentence. I, I had a patient once who who uh, let his left hand uh, be the character of the unconscious and his right hand be his ego. And it was amazing what kind of a dialogue they produced. So with his left hand, he would write something and, and that character would take over while he's writing with his left hand. And then he would respond with his right hand. So it was a, a dialogue and, and the left hand turned out to be a little boy who was very angry and upset about something. And then in his right hand, he was the, was the grown up and the adult and he could respond to it. So it can be included in, in, a, in a journal. Um, or if you, do it, uh, if you do it the way Jung did it, or do it walking, or while you're, while you're uh, in movement, or painting, or something, you might, uh, what I advise people to do is finish the act of imagination in about uh, 20 or 30 minutes, and then take 10 minutes or so to write down in your journal what you have experienced. You might want to take more than 10 minutes. Depends on what's, what's happened and the amount of detail you want to give it. But that's very important to keep a record uh, so that you, you can look back and you can see what the process has been. It's like keeping, exactly like keeping a, dr a dream journal. So in your dream journal, you might make a section or, or just indicate different color of pen or, or just in some other way, indicate what is active imagination and what is dream. Uh, but uh, I like that question because it does bring to the point, uh, bring out the point that one should really ideally keep a record of active imagination so you can watch the process unfolding. Okay, is there a question from Raleigh? Uh, no, not right now. Thank you. Okay, from Omaha? Sorry, I can't hear you, Omaha. I can't hear you. Barely. <laughs> Check it. All right. We'll try again. Uh, why do you think the uh, practice of active imagination fell out of favor in the last 50 years? And to what do you attribute its resurgence? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I was again going to comment on that a, a little later, but this is a good opportunity. I think it fell out of favor, out of favor for a couple of reasons. One, when um, Jungian analysis was brought into other cultures, it looked uh, looked a little too introverted. Uh, American culture has a hard time with introverted activities. They tend to get pathologized. Um, and so, uh, because there's such a cultural bias against inner work, or there was, I think it's gotten better. And I think that's one of the reasons it's turned around because there's, you know, I think the culture is slowly moving in a more balance, into a more balanced state. Uh, for quite a long time, it was seen as something rather bizarre and strange to be doing. In Zurich, it didn't look that strange. I think culturally, the introverted life is much more acceptable in Europe generally than it was in the United States. Also in England, um, what happened in England was that um, uh, Jungian analysis and modern psychoanalysis uh, uh, came together in a very interesting and dynamic way. And psychoanalysis, uh, the psychoanalytic schools, uh, object relations and all of that came really to dominate the classic Jungian uh, Zurich model. And uh, their transference interpretation really became the central feature of, uh, of analysis. Um, and in the States as well, I, I know I was uh, very actively involved in, in, in the field uh, of uh, Jungian thought and, and training and, and teaching in the, uh, from the mid-70s on. And there was a tremendous surge of interest uh, in um, in object relations theory, in cohut, in modern psychoanalysis, and in blending Jungian uh, perspectives and ideas and methods with these newly emergent uh, psychoanalytic ideas, at least new to uh, on the American scene. 
and uh, active imagination just didn't didn't fit in with any of that. Uh, and so because there was so much interest in, I would say, in transference interpretation, in reductive analysis, in, in going back into, into examination of early childhood issues, active imagination is really more located in the here and now. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it has more of a tele teleological orientation, uh, which is the classic Jungian uh, perspective, you know, that the unconscious is trying to go somewhere. Yes, it has come from somewhere, but it's also trying to go somewhere. Uh, that's the teleological uh, perspective. Active imagination is very useful for moving ahead. It's not so useful for moving backward. Uh, for moving backward, memory becomes very important. Uh, uh, you, everybody becomes a, a Marcel Proust for a while. You know, you, you remember things past. You try to recover your childhood and you try to recover the feelings of your childhood. And, and if you have traumas in childhood, who doesn't have traumas, but especially serious traumas from childhood that resulted in, in, in serious life, you know, distorting complexes, you want to go back there and re-examine it. Uh, and so this emphasis on reductive interpretation, going back into childhood, analytic, psychoanalytic ideas, um, really uh, skewed, I would say skewed the Jungian approach away from active imagination, to some extent even away from working with dreams, because psychoanalysts don't work that much with dreams either. Freudian psychoanalysts, modern psychoanalysts, they work much more with um, interpretation of, of, of um, transference, interpretation of resistances, interpretation of blocks, and, and so on. Um, it's much more interpretive. Again, active imagination, another point about it is it's not interpreted. In fact, Jung, Jung uh, discourages the analyst from interpreting it because interpretation will block it. It will stop the flow. So when the analyst receives an active imagination, or a picture as Paul will say, you might comment on it, you might discuss it in a kind of, you know, uh, encouraging way to do some more. You look at it and you relate it to what has come before and you begin to see a process unfolding, but you don't interpret it the way you might interpret a dream. You take associations, you look at the past, you look at history, you look at what happened the day before. All that goes into a dream interpretation, typically, is not done to an active imagination because you want the process to keep going. You don't want to stop it and interpretation can freeze. Then you start thinking more about the interpretation than about the figures. You start wondering, what does it mean if the figure says this to me? Oh my God, does it mean that? Where is this going? And you start second guessing it. So it's like, you know, thinking about riding a bicycle and trying to ride a bicycle at the same time it doesn't work that well. Active imagination is a process and it needs to keep flowing. So interpretation is handled very delicately and very lightly. Um, and, uh, and, because interpretation was so central to these other forms of, of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis that were being picked up by, by the Jungian schools in the United States, I think active imagination fell by the wayside. Now I think it's coming back because there is a retrieval. There's a retrieval afoot of Jung, even in England. They are again reading Jung at the SAP in London. The Society of Analytical Psychology for many years didn't read Jung. They, they read Melanie Klein. Their articles were more Kleinian than the Kleinians. Um, and they prided themselves on that, and, but now uh, gradually they've started coming back and there's a reappreciation and a recovery of Jung's genius, I think. And if you really go back into the way Jung did it and the way Jung formulated it and practiced it, you'll see that active imagination is absolutely central to, uh, to the way he practiced analysis and the way that first generation of people practiced analysis. I'm not saying we want to go back there necessarily, I'm not that kind of an analyst, but I'm saying there is something to recover there, and I think to bring out more strongly in our practices than has been the case very often in, in modern times, in, contem in the contemporary setting. I'll take one more question, and then I want to say some further things about the rules that I give, that Steve asked about the two rules, how to do active imagination, I want to say something also about the theoretical uh, ground, grounding behind the importance of active imagination. So is there a question from, let's say, um, Charlotte? Uh, yes, I have a question. 
Um, how does a person gain insight from the process of active imagination? Um, I think it's a slow process of insight. Um, I, I'm not sure insight is quite the right word. I would say uh, a living experience of the inner world, a living, a living experience of the inner other uh, that can bring insight, uh, it, it, insight in the sense of enlightenment. Suddenly you see something you didn't see before, but it's a different kind of insight from what we get when we put together, say, a piece of behavior that we're subject to, that we, a trap we keep falling into, and then we see how it's related to a complex that's connected to our childhood, and then we have an insight. Oh, that's where that comes from. That's why I feel that when these circumstances are in place. That's why I react the way I do. That's typically what we call an insight, making these kinds of connections. That's not so true with active imagination. It can be. What Jung says he got from active imagination, it's a very important thing to think about, but he says the most important thing he got from active imagination was the notion of psychic reality. And what he meant by psychic reality was that the inner world is bigger than the conscious world, and uh, that, the, that there are aspects to the psyche that one isn't aware of, but that are there all the time and are working. And uh, he says that uh, Philemon, this inner figure, taught me psychic objectivity. So what he uh, was able to, to um, bring into, into being in himself through these active imaginations was maybe the insight that the ego is not the master of its own, of the psyche, of its own home, so to speak. He says, uh, I learned that the thoughts that come to me are like birds that come and sit in the tree for a little while and fly away. They aren't mine. I don't own them. Uh, they come to me. Uh, they belong to somebody else, to something else, the self. Uh, so psychic objectivity is being able to see yourself from another perspective. Being able to see yourself maybe as other people see you or being able to see yourself as uh, from a, a from a, a point of view that isn't quite so subjective. Jung called it the objectivity of the psyche. That's what he got out of it. And I think that's what we can get out of it. If, if, because in these dialogues, after all, like in your dreams, the ego is just one player, one actor among other actors. So it's like you've got a theater going there and yeah, you've got a role to play and it's a very big role, it's a very important role as you can see in your dreams. Uh, especially where you know you're the center of attention typically not always but there are other figures and there are other aspects to the psyche and if you can see yourself from their point of view uh, you're beginning to develop psychic objectivity um, now that it leads me into what I want to say in, in the last part of my section of this seminar, and that is, um, has to do with the uh, development of the transcendent function through uh, active imagination and these dialogues that, uh, that come into being through active imagination. You know, the term transcendent function is one that's used in Jungian theoretical writings uh, from time to time, and Jung wrote an essay on it, I think it was like an experimental thought essay in 1916, very early in his uh, development as a Jungian. Uh, and he put it in a drawer and forgot about it and it was found in the 50s and then brought out and published. And in that essay, he talks a lot about active imagination. It's one of the major sources. It's in, uh, it's in this book uh, uh, edited by Joan Chodorov and she comments on it quite a bit. Uh, uh, the transcendent function is a, um, is a construct uh, that comes into being, uh, as Jung describes it, and as people experience it, somewhere between the conscious ego uh, position and the unconscious position. It's like a bridge, okay? It's an in-between spot. But it's a creation. Uh, like a bridge is a creation. It's, it's made and it is constructed. It becomes, a, a, uh, it becomes available to a person 
as a, a point of objective self-reflection, looking at yourself from a somewhat objective point of view, uh, it comes about through the process of active imagination, working with your dreams and so on, so that, you're, that the unconscious is taken seriously, okay, and enters into play, and you get this feeling of two or more sides, you know, to yourself. Now, Jung writes a, a line that I want to quote. It's the only thing I'll read today. It's from a, a, a paper he wrote called Problems of Psychotherapy. It's from the 1930s. It's in volume 16 of the Collected Works, uh, paragraph 327. Uh, 327. And he, he uses the word assimilation. You know, he talks quite a lot about assimilating the contents of the unconscious through working with dreams and active imagination. Assimilation. So assimilation usually means you take what is there and you build it into what is here. You bring it in and build it in, okay? That assimilating. If you assimilate somebody else's message, you really take it in, you make it your own, and you start using it, working with it. That mean, that's a, a, an assimilated learning. Once you've really got it and you can use it, it's assimilated, okay? So he says assimilation in the sense he's using it, in this sense, means mutual penetration of conscious and unconscious. Mutual penetration, and that's the phrase I want to pick up on. Mutual penetration, because he says the unconscious has to change as well as consciousness. He says mutual penetration or assimilation is not, as is commonly thought and practiced, a one-sided evaluation, just an interpretation, and deformation of unconscious contents by the conscious mind. Okay, it isn't just a one-way street. Assimilation also affects the unconscious. Now this dialectical process that he writes about often, he uses the term dialectical, interpenetration of conscious and unconscious. So the unconscious figures penetrate into consciousness, and the conscious attitudes penetrate into the unconscious. And this process, this dialectical process, results in this position called the transcendent function. Okay, so it is, it is a construct. It's something you have to build. It doesn't just fall on you like a dream or something like that. And it's built up through, these, uh, through this introverted uh, activity we call active imagination. And, and also working with dreams. Now, that's the rationale, the deepest rationale that I know for active imagination and why it's important. Interpenetration and setting up the dialectic that Jung felt is so important. Why is the dialectic so important? Because we are all made up of at least two parts, conscious and unconscious. But the unconscious is very complex and has many sides, as does consciousness. You're also a complexity in consciousness. And in order to get this whole system to interact in a, in a, in a kind of balanced or unified way, you have to have communications going on between conscious and unconscious parts. So that's why it's important to get to know your shadow, so you know what your shadow is thinking, or what the anima is thinking. Uh, what might be hidden away in the self that you don't even know about, have never seen before. You know, that you're receptive to it, and also that you interact with it, and it changes as you change. That mutual changing and interpenetration is really the rationale for the uh, activity of, and the practice of active imagination. Now, in the few minutes I've got left before our break, I want to talk about the two rules that I give to people who want to practice active imagination. I say to them that active imagination is some, something that anybody can do. Everybody can do. Uh, it really depends on you. And why do I say that? Because everybody dreams, and active imagination is really just nothing more than a waking dream. You're dreaming while you're awake. Uh, if you can dream while you're sleeping, why can't you dream while you're awake? Well, there might be reasons. You might be blocked, you might be afraid, you might have defenses and so on that get in the way. Those can be overcome. Uh, 
especially in analysis, if you, um, you know, go into it a ways and you begin to get a little more comfortable with yourself and you aren't as afraid of what might be in there the way Jung was, he, you have to realize he didn't have an analysis when he started out doing this. He was his own analyst and he had had some experiences of sorts with some other people, but he didn't really have the kind of analysis that we know today. Uh, but once you get a little relaxed with yourself, if you follow two rules, you can do active imagination. And the two rules are these. Number one, when you clear your mind and make a, an empty space, a blank space there, Gesheyan lesson, and you say to yourself, I'm just going to let come whatever comes, okay? That's the preparation. Uh, Wu Wei, and uh, you, you prepare yourself to receive. Rule number one, whatever comes, receive it. I said that before already. Whatever comes, receive it. Because once you start judging and editing and second guessing, you destroy the whole thing. It won't work. So that's rule number one. Block the editor out. Forget about it. what's good enough. Just let it happen and receive what comes. And then once it's come, once something is there, and I'll tell you a funny story about that as I conclude, once it's there, um, second rule is, if it moves, follow it. If it moves, follow it. Uh, when something moves, something speaks, something starts doing something autonomously, that's where it's alive. And that's where you need to go. Uh, a leaf moves. A dog appears and wags its tail. Somebody speaks. Wherever it's alive, that's the place to engage because that's where the psyche is beginning to show itself. The unconscious, the autonomous psyche is coming in and you will be surprised. So wherever you're surprised, something moves, something acts, follow it. Whatever comes, receive it. If it moves, follow it. And if you do this uh, for a, um, a number of days regularly and with some discipline, clear your mind at, on day one, receive whatever comes, stay with it for 20 or 30 minutes, stop it, write down what happened. On day two, go back to where you stopped on day one. Again, now, back to where you stopped on day one. On day two of, of Jung's active imagination, which I didn't tell you about, he went back to look for Solomon and Elijah. It was hard to get there, but he found them finally. So go back to where you stopped on day one and sit there and wait until something moves. Again, follow it, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, stop, write it down. Do this for 30 days. And at the end of 30 days, you will have a place and you will have a set of characters that are relatively stable. The difference about, between an active imagination environment and a dream environment is active imagination is reliable and stable. A dream environment is mercurial. It changes every night. You can't predict it. You have no idea what's going to happen tonight in your dreams. You can try to program it. Sometimes it's hit or miss. You might be lucky once or twice. But generally, it's very autonomous and it always surprises you. Active imagination is always there. It's a stable environment. And after 20 or 30 days in doing this in a disciplined fashion, and following these rules, you will have more or less what Jung had. You will have a set of characters. You'll have a place you can go to, people you can talk to, get their advice. You can take your dreams in there and talk, discuss them with these characters if you want to, or talk about your troubles and problems, or meditate, or well, you can do any number of things. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's how I teach it. And sometimes I teach it in groups, and then people come back and tell me what they've experienced, and I try to coach them a little bit, say, well, you know, uh, Sometimes people fall asleep. That's okay if you fall asleep. Next time, try a little harder. Try again. Uh, maybe try walking instead of sitting. And don't lie down. Don't get quite so comfortable. But go to a place where you aren't distracted by phone calls, email messages, horns blasting, traffic, whatever. You have to be in a place that's relatively contained and quiet. And I'm going to stop after just telling you the story that I heard from uh, someone who worked with uh, Mary Louise von Franz. She had a patient once who wanted to do, uh, or she encouraged to do active imagination. So he said he would try to do it. 
And she told him how to do it, and he went home and came back and uh, told her, uh, well, nothing happened. She said, well, try it again. Uh, he went home, came back the next session, again, nothing happened. And she said, insisted, well, just keep trying, just keep trying. After about six months or so of this, he came back one day and he said, you won't believe what happened. I actually saw something. And she said, oh, what was it? And he said, I saw the head of a goat uh, from the side. I saw the profile of a goat. And she said, that's great. Uh, well, go back to that goat, see what happens. So he went back to the goat and he came back the next time. She said, well, what happened? He said, nothing happened. I just sat there and looked at the goat. He didn't move, I didn't move. So try again. He tried this for about six months, nothing happened. One night, middle of the night, she got a phone call, 4 a.m. And it's this patient and he says, uh, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to admit me to the hospital, I'm going crazy, I'm, I'm having a psychotic break. She said, oh my God, well, I, I, can you hold it until eight o'clock in the morning? I've got a free hour, you can come in and I'll see you at eight o'clock in the morning. Tell me what's happening, can, can you wait that long? He said, well, okay, but I'm really in a panic. I, something terrible has happened. Oh, he comes in at 8 o'clock in the morning. She says, well, what happened? He said, you won't believe it. I was sitting there looking at this goat. Yes. The goat moved. She said, really? He said, shocking, the goat moved. And, and she said, well, what did he do? And, and he said, well, he turned and he looked at me. And he freaked me out. I, I thought I was going mad. She said, listen, that's supposed to happen. That's what's supposed to happen. It's okay. So he had his first real experience of active imagination after a long period of trying. He was very blocked, but he was persistent, and he finally got there. That's where you want to get. When that thing really starts moving on its own and surprises you, you might be shocked a little bit at first, but it's a good sign. And take it to your analyst and discuss it, and uh, you've, you've started down the road toward uh, a new phase of your individuation process. Okay, so uh, I think it's time to take a break. Steve, why don't you come on and give some instructions, and after the break, we'll be back, and Paul will do his piece of this.